egoísmo sério. event um, about two hours ago we ended the first part with a focus on the east-west divide eastern european populism western european populism um, we'll obviously talk a little bit about that right now but we'll mostly focus on the way out of the polarized landscape on solutions for populism on the way the mainstream political parties have dealt with populism some very smart people on stage so in about two hours the whole problem will be solved, <laughs> or perhaps even sooner. Um, the first 20 to 25 minutes, uh, we'll have a discussion on stage. There are a lot of chairs, it will eventually everybody, every chair will be uh, filled, maybe um, we'll do musical chairs if we don't have enough chairs. Uh, but we'll start with two of the most foremost thinkers about populism, globalization, uh, and, and all that kind. The first uh, is Jan Werner Müller. Um, he's a German author and a professor at Princeton University. He wrote a book, What is Populism? in 2016. It's been translated into many languages. He was here this afternoon and we are welcoming him back. And the other one, Paul Schaeffer, um, a Dutch author. Um, everybody here in the Netherlands knows him. He's been published in numerous European newspapers and he's currently working on a new book which we will come out in September. So I'd like to welcome both of them on stage for our initial talk, Jan Werner Müller and Paul Schaeffer. You can take a Anywhere. Well, first of all, um, since Jan Werner Müller already talked quite a bit about population, uh, pop, pop, Sorry, populism and his definition of it. Um, so, so, Paul Schaeffer, for you, what are we talking about when we are talking about populism and um, it has a negative connotation in a way and is that fully justified? Well, my initial response would be that um, populism is defined by um, a criticism or rejection of establishment of elites. That is where it begins. And to a certain extent, it reminds me of the 60s, period also, of a rejection of the establishment. I can remember very well myself being part of the student movement, very much being against the established authorities, claiming for uh, different professors, etc., etc. That came mostly from the left. Uh, definitely, but it was a revolt against the establishment uh, in many ways. And now, of course, the irony is that this new revolt against the establishment is against the establishment that basically took power in the wake of the 60s and the 70s, with a very liberal uh, way of looking at the world. Um, so there is where it begins. And I would say it's not a rejection of elites as such, but a yearning for better elites. So one sentence of John McCarré, very famous political scientist, it comes to mind, he writes in the little drummer girl, he writes, a rebel is he who is looking for a better conformity. And I, like, I love this sentence because I think that captures beyond the idea of you know, criticizing populism as being a rejection of elites as such, perhaps we could understand it also as a yearning for better elites. That is the first observation. second one would be that if I try to understand the rational core, there is a lot of irrationality things that I wouldn't want to try to understand them. But if I try to understand the rational core, I would say, like the revolt in the 60s was about opening a space, freedom, more individual freedom. Now it's about defining a space, perhaps closing a space. I would define populism in its rational core as a form of protectionism with a left-wing motive, social protectionism, defending 
social rights, social equality in a time of globalization, in a form of cultural protectionism, originally more on the right side, of course, defending national identity that is being challenged in the era of globalization. Both of these forms of uh, protectionism fuse in parties like the Front National, which have a very left-wing uh, political program when it comes to social rights, for example, re the age of retirement, all these questions. So that is why it confuses the left-right divide uh, in many ways. A party like the PVV also in the Netherlands is against uh, the increase of the retirement age and in favor of protecting social rights, etc. So as it, is, if it is a form of protectionism in its rational core, then of course there are possible answers, but we'll come to that. But so I would define it as anti-establishment, anti-elite, but understood as a call for better elites. And I would understand it as a form of protectionism mm -hmm. that can be challenged or be answered in a rational way. That matches the description you gave earlier, I think, in many ways. But fortunately, not entirely, because otherwise there would be nothing to discuss. <laughs> so where I would respectfully differ a little bit is that, yes, it's true that populists, when in opposition, criticize the powerful, criticize those who have been in power for quite some time in some cases. But for me, that's not enough to be counted a populist. Actually, being critical with the powerful can be a perfectly good sign of democratic engagement. What populists do, in addition, in my view, is to claim that they, and only they, represent what they usually call the real people or also the silent majority. That means, from their point of view, that all other contenders for power are fundamentally illegitimate. This is never just a disagreement about policy or even about values, which is completely normal, ideally even productive in a democracy. No, they always immediately make it personal and moral. So the others are always condemned as corrupt or, to coin a phrase, crooked. And secondly, they're also always going to say that all those citizens who do not share their understanding of the real people perhaps don't belong to the people at all. So my suggestion is to understand populism not so much as a form of protectionism, but as a particular form of always excluding others and also to reduce all political disagreement ultimately to questions of identity. So if you disagree with Donald Trump, he's going to tell you that you're un-American. If you disagree with Kaczynski, he's going to say you have treason in your genes. And this is how populists talk differently from, if I may put it that way, normal politicians, who may also be very critical with existing elites. You mentioned Trump. I mean, Hillary Clinton f famously spoke, and, and she did that once, so, but, but still, about the... But we'll never forget it. No, we won't, but isn't there a reason for it? I mean, it, it, she spoke about the deplorables, and, and um, isn't it the case that many on the left, like a, a speaker in the earlier sessions, session talks, the, the, the left often talks about populists. Even if, even if they feel pity for them, it's like, poor souls, if they would only understand things better. Isn't that the same? That's also looking down uh, on people in a way. So I, I agree that there are many, 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 many misguided responses <laughs> to populism. It's certainly a mistake to, in a sense, respond symmetrically. So because you are always excluding others, we will now exclude you. That seems an obvious contradiction. It's also, I think, often based on a claim to knowing the voters that is not really covered by empirical evidence. <laughs> so p leaders, from my point of view, from within my account, I can tell whether somebody is a populist or not. Because if someone like Erdogan says, we are the people, and then turning to his critics, who are you? That's pretty conclusive evidence. They're telling us about their, in essence, anti-pluralism. With voters, we should never assume that all of them must necessarily also be anti-pluralist and dangerous for democracy. Nor should we, as you're hinting at, in, I think, rightly criticizing a certain position, nor should we adopt this kind of patronizing, quasi-therapeutic attitude where one says, look, they're all very emotional, fears, anxieties, and so on. Oh. Even if we talk about emotions, because we all have emotions after all, uh, even Angela Merkel, um, it's important to understand that you cannot simply divide emotions from reasons. So let's even grant this cliched language that everybody is angry, which actually in many cases may well not be true. But let's assume for the sake of argument, yes, people really are angry. 
Well, people have reasons to be angry. It's based on a kind of cognitive antecedent, forgive the highfalutin term, a kind of judgment that says there's an injustice, something is unfair, and that's bringing me to a certain kind of critical, critical stance. And all that is completely normal and okay in the democracy. Having said that, if then, you know, my next move is to say, and by the way, these already vulnerable minorities are to blame for all that unfairness. Well, okay, then I think we can get into a debate about, you know, whether we have to accept all of that at fair's value. So we should always be, in a sense, although that can also, of course, sound very patronizing, should always be ready to listen. But it doesn't mean that everything that is offered as reasons then has to be accepted. For you, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I know you will, populism has a negative connotation in, in almost every way, or not? So from my framework, which you may or may not want to find plausible, yes, it's, a, it's an entirely negative term in the sense that populists are anti-pluralists. They categorically deny the legitimacy of their opponents. Um, and in that sense, it goes against what I see as core features of democracy. And that also, I think, should get us away from what I, some, I think sometimes people want to do, which is to say, oh, well, it's just a kind of style, or they have some uncouth rhetoric, everybody's a bit of a populist sometimes. No, I think, following on a famous insight by Hannah Arendt, you know, we need, we need these terms to draw distinctions. And yes, sometimes it can be rough where exactly the line can be drawn, the evidence is not always entirely conclusive, I grant all that. But there is a difference between how, let's say, the Erdogans, the Orbans, the Kaczynskis, the Chavezes talk, and how the others talk. And that actually, I'm happy to say, uh, even some empirically working political scientists have said, look, if you study their discourses, this is not just some subjective thing that, oh, I don't like this politician, therefore I'm calling you a populist. No, there really is a qualitative difference. Before we go to Paul, I, I, I guess Trump is an exception in that sense that even though he is a populist, but a lot of it is rhetoric because he governs in a very traditional Republican way when it comes to lower taxes or all, all that kind of stuff. A, a lot of, 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 of what's about him is rhetoric. Um, it's it's they're not the pra practical stuff yet as we see in Poland or, or Turkey or Hungary. Uh, I mean, he talks about jailing reporters, but fortunately he hasn't. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad that I thought there was a hint of doubt in your question, because I, I hope you're right. It's true that we should not simply equate, you know, Turkey with the U.S., obviously very different, different, different institutional setups. As we've seen, the U.S. has proven somewhat resilient, as we discussed earlier today, sometimes in surprising ways. So something that, for instance, used to be seen as very negative on the American left, federalism, because it was basically states' rights, it was protecting parts of the country against civil rights, you know, defending in, in, in a certain way forms of discrimination, all of a sudden is discovered as a positive resource because Trump can certainly, to some degree, ignore a self-styled resistance out on the streets. He can ignore, to some degree, even Democrats in Congress. If California says, we're not implementing this, he cannot ignore this. And as with all dissent, you know, you want to get into a dialogue. You want the authorities to kind of start talking to you, so something positive might, might possibly come out of that. So that's true. At the same time, I would, I would be careful with the view that, oh, it's basically all, 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 all over because he's shown to be so incompetent, nothing is really working. Just one, one sort of uh, example. Yes, the wall hasn't gone up, but the invisible wall has gone up already. So if, if you nowadays try to get a, get a visa for the U.S., if you look at who de facto is being deported, rounded up, deported, and so on, lots of stuff is happening. And even if the wall never goes up, I think from what we know now, Trump in 2020 can certainly say with good reasons, look, we got rid of these Hondurans, we got rid of these people from El Salvador, we did a lot we could, we could do under the circumstances. Like all populists, even though he's in power, he will have no problem conjuring up yet another shadowy globalist elite that prevented the people from having their real will implemented. That's what they all do, of course. So in that sense, I think it's too complacent to think that, oh, because he hasn't implemented anything that we've seen elsewhere, we can basically rest content. Paul, the same question for you. Does, does populism for you always have this negative connotation or not necessarily? Well, I see the ambivalence. Uh, I do agree that um, for me, the starting point would be that it's trying to reinvent a sense of agency in an era of globalization. We're often told, for example, in the debate about migration, there's no alternative. Angela Merkel, every second phrase is alternativlos. 
So, that is where it begins. People say we don't agree with the world as it is. We see, for example, that globalization produces more inequality, forms of alienation. We respond to that. That is where it begins. The ambivalence is, of course, that when there are no alternatives within the framework of a liberal democracy, these answers, these engagements, spill over into illiberal answers. And that is, of course, where your argument um, uh, is very pertinent, that, of course, one sees the temptation of defining a population always in forms of exclusion by defining the other, for sure. But the problem is, of course, that every sense of drawing borders and every community is in circle of solidarity that is defined, is not has its own limits. So how are we going to define a sense of community, nationally or in Europe, that is still within the boundaries of a liberal imagination? So we have left, I think, in many ways, the idea of defining communities in an inclusive, open way, saying it is impossible to answer these questions in an era of globalization. Boundaries evaporate, we're living in a limitless world. Whereas many people are asking for a new imagination. So my search is, can you give this imagination, can you give answers to populism in a liberal vein? I think it is possible, but I add it's only possible within the context of the European Union. Have you seen good examples of that? You're, you're, you're about to finish your book, I suppose, on, yeah. on uh, globalization and, well, the editors are waiting for the first... Um, <laughs> yes. Um, We're trying. So I suppose you're, 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 you've been looking around Europe for, for um, also an answer to the question whether the mainstream parties learned their lesson, whether the liberal critique is, uh, is, is, is valid. Um, well, have they found an answer? Well, but um, my colleague here can give uh, perhaps better answers as a political scientist, but the unraveling of the traditional parties has many other causes, I would say. But if we confine ourselves to this element, is it possible to give answers? I think uh, Macron, in his way, when he says, une, uh, une Europe qui protège, a Europe that protects. So seeing the European Union not only as opening a space, but also giving way to new forms of protection, data protection, for example, protection of your borders, uh, protection against um, companies that don't want to pay tax, etc. So this whole new agenda of the European Union is trying, you know, hesitantly, with all the contradictions of a union of 28, soon 27, but it's trying to come up with a new agenda. And I see that as at least part of an answer. It's part of an answer because this unraveling of these classical parties that basically began with Berlusconi in Italy, wiping away the Christian democracy, wiping away socialist party. If I've observed this very from very close, uh, meeting some of these traditional politicians in Italy and seeing the corruption. I mean, there were many other reasons why Berlusconi got this possibility, but I always felt already in the mid 90s that Berlusconi was opening up a new space, in a way, and defining what not only an oddity, and in Macron, in many ways, has repeated the feat of, but in a different vein, but also with a promise of modernization, has wiped away the traditional uh, establishment in France, and trying to come up with new answers. I see the authoritarian uh, seduction also with Macron, one person, political movement has inbuilt forms of authoritarianism. That's also the French That's presidential tradition. He doesn't yes, own four but TV more than stations. that. more than that. Right. And, um, Hollande was a very different president. Right. But um, so in that sense, um, I think the program, but it, that is not, a, not the only answer, but mm -hmm. definitely part of the answer, a program of a European Union that defines not only new freedoms by opening up borders, but also tries to understand when you have a common border, what is then needed in terms of protection um, in a liberal way? You mentioned Italy. Um, obviously, yesterday the new Italian government was installed to populist parties. They're going to try and, and, and govern together with a, a technocrat prime minister at, at the head. 
Um, how, how are you looking at, at Italy and what may it mean for Europe in, in case this government, um, you know, is yeah. well being successful in Italy means, I guess, staying in power for a year and a half, which would be a record. But um, <laughs> well, but how are you looking at, at this new uh, government? Well, in terms of the euro, it's definitely, to put it mildly, a challenge. <laughs> um, I've been interviewing 20 years ago uh, one of the leaders of the Dutch National Bank who was very uh, much involved in the negotiations about Italy's entry or not into the eurozone, who already at that time said, you know, they, they lowered within one year their budget deficit from seven to three points. And he said, it's complete fake. And they're being smuggled into this monetary union for historic political reasons, but definitely not able to live up to what this monetary union will be asking of them. And he predicted 20 years ago exactly what is going on now, that Europe would fall apart to begin from the periphery. So Poland, Hungary, Greece, Italy now, the UK out, the North never was fully part of the European Union, Norway is not a member, Sweden and Denmark are not participating in the Euro, so Europe is unraveling at its periphery, and he said it's only you can wait for the moment that this unraveling touches, uh, falls back into the heart of Europe in Germany. If I see now what was the promise of a uni unified Europe, this, this symbol of the Euro, how poisoned the atmosphere in Germany is, when it comes to attitudes towards Italy, how poisoned in Italy attitudes are towards Germany. You cannot possibly maintain this idea that the Euro brought Europe together. It's dividing it in many ways unforeseen, but foreseen by others. So there is where it begins. And then secondly, I think it was a huge mistake to block this minister because it only fuels this impression of um, high-handedness from Brussels, from Berlin. You mean the president blocking the yeah, supposed I think minister What you should finance. do with populists is basically give them a chance to govern right. and govern themselves into oblivion. So was this an old reflex, what the president did? And you're saying that was completely not the well, answer you to see that my understanding of it is, but uh, you might have a different view on this, but I think he discovered very quickly that what he tried to prevent, that he exactly provoked it, uncertainty in the markets, etc. So he came back, there was this false compromise. I think, you know, in the end, if there is a majority for this government, let them govern. He should, as a president, but also the European <coughs> Union, define the space of legality. But outside, uh, inside of that, let them make their choices and find out how difficult it is. or. The other consequence would be that when you're in the Euro, you basically lost some of the essentials of your um, democracy. Mm -hmm. So that is what Utinger basically said, let the markets teach them that you shouldn't vote for these kind of parties. Others have said the same. I think it's uh, irresponsible and it only reinforces this idea that basically within the European Union, democracy is eroded mm -hmm. and that you lose your sense of uh, self-determination. I think it's very problematic. Is it a litmus test for populism in a way, what's going on now in, in Italy, or at least for their ability to govern? So maybe try two observations, if I may. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not so sure that they will govern themselves into oblivion. Somehow they haven't done that in Hungary, in Poland, in Turkey. They're all still there. I Different think it's not societies in terms of democracy, democratic tradition. The Freedom Party in 2000. Remember 2006, people said Wolfgang Schüssel, the Christian Democrat, yeah. what a genius. You know, he took them into government, they proved themselves so obviously corrupt and incompetent, he got them down to, you know, he, they lost about 10% or so. People said, fantastic. But where are they now? Yeah. They're back. So I think we should not be quite so confident that, you know, we can always be sure that all their ideas are simplistic or, you know, they're going to prove to, to so, so incompetent that they will necessarily fail. If I may, let me add one, one word about uh, something that you, I think, brought up, but maybe that is worth underlining. Um, I think it's been very tempting sometimes for opponents of populism to basically retreat to a position which for shorthand you, we might call technocratic. And I think that's also, I think, the case with our great savior from populism, Macron. A lot of what he presents today sounds a little bit like a second coming of the third way, by <laughs> which I mean a kind of attitude where somebody says, here's a reasonable center, 
which is also why Macron can say people from the left and the right can all join. It's not about partisanship. If you're reasonable, you can join this government. And then we have these crazy extremes, which of course, you know, works well as an image in France. You can say Mélenchon is crazy and Le Pen is crazy too. But it's another way of telling people, if you don't support us, you're not reasonable. You're kind of irrational. That was even stronger, of course, during the Euro crisis, when many people simply said there is one correct solution to this. You mentioned the lovely German word, alternative laws. If you disagree with us, you reveal yourself to be irrational. That, of course, provides a fantastic opening for populists to say, what do you mean democracy without choices? Where are the people in this? It doesn't mean that the populists, therefore, are the authentic defenders of democracy. I don't think they are. But they're going to be strengthened. And when they're strengthened, and this is how it basically becomes a vicious circle, if they're strengthened, technocrats are going to become even more technocratic because they're going to say, look, you let people decide, they elect crazies. So let's take even more decision-making power away from them. And while it looks like we have two extremes here, in a certain way, they have one thing in common, because they're both forms of anti-pluralism. The technocrat says only one rational solution. If you disagree, you reveal yourself to be irrational. Populist says only one authentic will of the people. If you disagree with us, you reveal yourself to be a traitor to the people. And what's, in a sense, amazing about the Five Stars movement, about ma uh, among many other things, is that in a certain way, they also combine both. I mean, in certain ways, they are populist, but now they appoint all these non-politicians and say, look, there's going to be a clear, and you know, some of my colleagues have even called this techno-populism, where basically we now say there's one obviously correct solution, goes very much with Grillo at one point saying, look, you know, we're going to put like a housewife with three kids in charge of the economics ministry, because, you know, th she's more competent than all these economics professors, because the solution really for what needs to be done for Italy is obvious. So all of a sudden these supposed extremes can even meet in one movement. And everything that, at least I think, should be real democracy, choices, arguments, not making people feel that if they're on the losing side of a conflict, they're un-Italian or unreasonable or they're basically out of the game, all that disappears in this kind of dynamic. So therefore, why, irrespective of the individual decisions and people, I think it's, it's a dynamic that Europe should avoid, not this kind of technocracy versus populism. But, uh, but perhaps we would agree that um, and I'm glad you say this, that all this criticism that people are fearful, all these psycho psychological interpretations of political life. I mean, of course, politics is also about mobilization of emotions, fear. But the peace movement in the 80s against the cruise missiles was nothing else than mobilizing also fear for nuclear war. The environmental movement is also about mobilizing fear for ecological decline. The movement to install forms of social protection was also partly born out of fear of class struggle that went beyond the confines of a, you know, a re reconciliation. So many social improvements or um, uh, changes have been born out of a mixture of rational criticism but also mobilizing fear. So in that sense, uh, if we want to try to talk about in, in psychological terms, I would also always be reluctant because it's a paternalizing form of discourse, basically saying to people, you don't understand what your interests are, you don't understand your own ideas, we have to educate you into becoming modern citizens. Now, I would disagree a little bit with, about Macron. I see the technocracy, but I also see his European program. And if we don't agree with that, I would like to hear what other answers there are, you know, in terms of, for example, his ideas about une Europe qui protège, I th see at least some elements there that are the beginning of an answer. At least he's taking seriously, because I was feeling that in his opposition to the other 50% of France, that he might very much be drawn into, you know, an overstatement of liberalism and technocracy. But he is trying to reach out and trying to understand that in his thrive to modernize France, that he should also offer new forms of protection. So my feeling is, if we um, break down, step by step, forms of social protection, you end with protectionist majorities that might prove to be very dangerous. Uh, two more things, and, and then I want to introduce our next um, uh, uh, speakers, and then we'll have plenty of time for audience questions as well. First, you, you say about the Italians, let, let, let just play this out and see where they get. Um, 
and maybe they'll govern themselves into oblivion. In, in the Netherlands, um, Mark Rutte, our prime minister's first cabinet was with the PVV. That they were not in the cabinet, but they were yeah. uh, supporting the cabinet. Um, that was a failure, and basically most people in the Netherlands agree that the PVV will never be part of a government. In general, and maybe it's it's hard to generalize, but in general, is it would it be a good idea if all these populist parties in Western Europe um, would govern, be part of a coalition? Well, I mean, the AFD, would you say, you know, let Front National? Well, I mean, many of them, them are profit. governing. In many Denmark. of them are not. I mean. Yeah, but I mean, to start with, it's already been tried. I do agree with you that it was a little bit uh, too easy to say let them govern to oblivion because it's true that the PVV is still there after governmental experience that the FPÖ has survived. But on the other hand, you can not say that it changed Austria into a uh, closed society. If you look at the rates of migration, for example, in Austria, the, the number of asylum seekers that have been received in Austria, you cannot define it as a, as a country that is completely uh, defined by uh, populist parties. So in that sense, it definitely is for me an understanding of a democracy that if parties have such a following, you should give them a chance within the confines of the rule of law. So for example, in Geert Wilders, exactly, the, yes. the, 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 the essence of his program is absolutely in deep conflict with our constitution. What he basically says is only one thing. Muslims are second-rate citizens. They should adopt and understand our constitution, but our constitution should be amended in a way that it takes away their basic freedoms as, uh, as a religious community. So we have to close mosques, we have to forbid this. We have to... It's complete in a deep contradiction with our uh, constitution. So I would never allow such a program to be really put into act. So that is where your understanding and compromises should stop. But my view of it is, until now, most of these parties, when they govern, they stay within the limits of our understanding of at least the rule of law. There are not serious breaches, as far as I can see, but perhaps you have examples of populist parties in government that really take away basic freedoms that are you mean shrined in, in, in Europe. Western Europe. Yeah, that are, that's absolutely, I'm not talking about Hungary here, but I'm talking about Western Europe. So, but perhaps this decline of our democratic culture goes much further than we can envision now. F f finally, for this part, it's also, and we talked about it earlier, an, an urban-rural divide um, across the world, basically. And more and more people are moving to the cities in, in Europe, in, in the US as well. Does that mean that this problem and, and the, the, the polarization will only increase? I think it's, uh, it would be far too easy. Uh, you know, for example, if you look at Rotterdam, not that, exactly that's, the country. That's an example, but it, it is a populist party. Is there is already right. for many years the largest party. But it's an a very cosmopolitan right? city right. where many nationalities converge. So it's much too easy to say those are the people living in a different time zone, not catching up with modernity, not understanding the realities of modern urban life. But isn't Rotterdam an easy. exception, Paul? Well, Malmö would be another example. I mean, there are many cities where you, you can find that there's, uh, that they've changed enormously and that populist parties also have a following in these cities. So, yes, of course, they are above average represented outside of larger urban areas, but definitely it's not simply in urban. It is partly, it has to do with lower and higher education, I guess, those divides. But it's, uh, it's too simple, I think, to... to to frame it as an urban um, uh, countryside phenomenon. Okay. Can I say one more, if of I may, course. just one more general Yes, thing. that's why so we invited <laughs> you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> the, the, you know. Um, and also maybe to bring out a slight disagreement in an interesting way. So I think there's sometimes been a tendency, not, not you here tonight, but sometimes among, among people who react to populism, to kind of fall from one extreme into the other. So from the extreme of saying they're all demagogues, we don't believe a word of what they say. We can always discount, you know, all their policy solutions right away. It's simplistic. To sort of fall from that extreme into another extreme where all of a sudden politicians in particular start to say they know something about society that nobody else really knows. 
they know something about, as the cliched phrase then goes, people's real concerns, anxieties, sorrows, and so, and so on. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't discount their election successes, but I think this thought is sometimes based on a kind of misunderstanding of how democratic representation works. It sort of assumes that it's a kind of mechanical reproduction of already existing identities, interests, and you know, the populace finally discovers these identities and interests and brings them into the system. As opposed to what I think is a, is a more plausible understanding, which is to say, democratic representation is a very dynamic process. And in a sense, democracies are designed to enable as many people as possible to make a claim to representation and say, please follow me, if you see yourself like this, I'm going to offer you something plausible. I mean, this goes back to your example yeah, of the peace yeah. movement. So, uh, in that sense, yes, it means something if mobilization works. But it's not quite the same as some sort of, you know, objective truth that has now been discovered. If it goes on long enough, yes, it kind of solidifies. So, example, people in the U.S. nowadays, nowadays talk a lot about the Trumpist movement. As far as I can tell, there is no Trumpist movement. Unlike the Tea Party, that was real, that had organizational structures, that was continuous mobilization, whether it was astroturf or more spontaneous, we can debate, but there was a there there. Trumpist movement, I don't see that. But if enough other actors keep treating people like, oh, you are a member of the Trumpist movement, or you are the moderate Trump voter, so we'll give you whatever they think they need to do, give you a little bit of racism, some more nationalism, whatever they think then is right, yes, people are gonna see themselves that way, and then we might have a Trumpist movement in 50 years, long after Trump is gone. So all I'm trying to say is that there is some room here for creativity. Mm -hmm. And uh, dare I say, especially some left-wing parties in Europe today have this tendency behind closed doors more or less to say, damn it, it's too bad that workers nowadays hate foreigners, but that is just the way it is, and the populists have taught us that objective truth. And I think, again, I'm not saying it's all, it's all infinitely malleable, clearly it isn't. But it's also not a sort of given objective fact, which now everybody else has to kind of orient themselves around. But can I yeah, add one thing? Because um, I basically do agree that, of course, there is a performative mm -hmm. part of populism. It creates also realities. But um, I think for me, one, and that's what I try to do in my book, to describe the... the, 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 the extent of globalization in societies. And there you see not only the uneven uh, consequences of globalization within a society, some parts are more affected than others, etc. But also, I, would, I think it's very interesting to start with a very simple article I found in Le Monde the other day, where it was said seven out of 10 French people still live in the region where they were born. So if we study closely to what extent citizens are really mobile. We have an understanding of societies, everybody being very mobile. But if you look at where do people find employment, to whom do they marry, to whom do they feel a lasting sense of obligation, in what language can they meaningfully differ uh, from, with, uh, with the opinion of another, where do they find their rights, etc., then you find that the geography of most citizens are, is far more restricted than we think, and at, in my understanding of population, we should begin there. So it reveals certainly some social and cultural cleavages in our societies. It reveals something, but it's definitely reinforcing it. And I would agree with most of what you say, exactly to the extent that um, the danger of populism being not only revealing a cleavage, going beyond that and say we represent the real people, that of course is a huge threat to any democratic understanding. Okay. We'll go to, um, th thank you for that. We have asked three leading young thinkers in Europe to come up with two lessons on populism and I'll invite um, them on stage one by one. Um, the first is Claudia Schalisch from France, uh, the author of two books that both look at new forms of political engagement and democratic innovations. Um, my apologies if I mispronounce your last name, which I'm sure I did. Um, so the floor is yours. Oh, you don't have a mic, I'm sorry. <laughs> that helps. Great, thanks very much. Um, so I, my task has been to, to talk about two lessons on populism, so not an easy thing and I don't have all the answers, but uh, I've chosen to focus on some ideas for solutions more in terms of the 
some of the underlying causes of populism, um, namely this sense that people feeling like they don't have a voice to, to shape things because, quite honestly, they, they often don't. Um, so, so to begin with, um, I imagine that instead of using your smartphone to write to your friends and communicate and so on, you insisted on still using someone on horseback to send and deliver a message for you. Imagine that instead of using your washing machine, you still washed everything by hand. And imagine if instead of taking the train or your car or the plane, you still wanted to take a hot air balloon to get across the world. Now, this doesn't really make a lot of sense. Society has changed, technology has advanced, um, but when it comes to democracy and our democratic institutions, this logic doesn't seem to apply. We still hang on to the basic democratic infrastructure from the late 18th century. Uh, every four or five years, we go and we queue at a polling station to go and tick a little box beside the name of uh, beside the name of a person or a party that we like the most, or sometimes just dislike the least, and then in the time between that, we don't really have much of a chance to influence what any of those elected representatives are doing. Um, and so this model made sense during a time where people literally spent days to be able to get together and news traveled really slowly, but given how society has changed and uh, you know, people are more interconnected than ever before, relationships are more horizontal, society is more open, this doesn't really make sense to limit ourselves as that being the main democratic mechanism for making our collective decisions to solve our problems and to give people a sense of having a voice. If we were to redesign, you know, what would our democratic institutions look like today? If we had a blank slate, we knew nothing about elections, would elected representative democracy be what we came up with to solve our problems today? Now, I don't have the answer, but I personally highly doubt it. Um, so, unfortunately, we don't have the option of starting from a blank slate, uh, but fortunately, there are some politicians and some, and some people thinking about how can we at least start to reshape and rethink our democratic institutions to be more fitting for the 21st century and a better way of solving our collective problems. So, I invite you to transplant yourselves with me to Melbourne in 2014. Um, here, the, the council was having an election, so, you know, the traditional process took place, there were lots of promises made, and then the councillors got into power and, well, they, they couldn't quite fulfil all of their promises because actually not all of that was possible, the budget wasn't there and so on. So, they're not the only politicians to have ever encountered this problem, it might sound like a familiar situation to some of you, um, but what they did to solve this was unique and I think a really good example of what we could be trying to do differently. Um, so, instead of deciding in a closed room between themselves, right, what shall we do now? Um, they decided to have the Melbourne People's Panel. So what they did was they invited 10,000 people across the city randomly to be part of a panel that would decide on the city's 10-year, $5 billion budget. Um, amongst the 10,000 people who were invited, around 2,000 people said, oh yeah, I'd like to do this, I'm free on all those dates. And amongst those people, they then chose a, a smaller group of around 43 people who were, you know, you can't say statistically representative, but who represented a wide cross-section of society in Melbourne. And these people were given an opportunity to meet six times over the course of three to four months. During that time, they were given a chance to learn, you know, what is the budget, how is it set, how does it work, what are the options, and so on. They were given the time to deliberate with one another, you know, based on everything they learned, hearing each other's diverse perspectives, experiences, ideas, and then also the time to draft really concrete, thoughtful, precise recommendations for what should these priorities be. And at the end of this process, they presented in front of the council and the public all of their recommendations. The council then went away for seven months and they thought about it. They also took in mind all of the kind of stakeholder engagement that they did and the expert opinions and so on. And then they reunited the Melbourne People's Panel as well as the wider public to announce this 10-year $5 billion plan. 
And here they, they let everyone know that they accepted 10 out of the 11 recommendations that they got. Um, so there were 11 but with lots of kind of sub ideas and so on. And they explained why they couldn't and could do what they were doing. And even in the appendix of the sort of document they put together for this, there's, um, there's a sort of chart which has in the words of the People's Panel, their recommendations, if they're doing good or not, and then how exactly they'll actually implement it. So the follow through, the follow through was there. So the outcome of this, it gave citizens some valuable sense of you know, contributing to being able to shape the policies that are affecting their lives. It gave the council more ambitious ideas than they would have dared to do otherwise, and it allowed them to close a $900 million budget hole. And then it gave the public a sense that, okay, people like me actually had a, 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 a genuine voice in shaping some of these policies that are going to affect us for the next 10 years. Now, this is only one example. In my last book called uh, The People's Verdict, I looked at 48 case studies like this one in Canada and Australia alone over the past decade. Um, so examples ranging from updating Ontario's housing legislation to determining the privacy um, issues concerning a new identity card that was going to be issued in British Columbia a strategy for tackling obesity in the state of Victoria, um, a third year infrastructure investment strategy in the state of Victoria as well. In Canada, the National Mental Health Action Plan was decided in this kind of way. And there are many, many more examples. And they range on a whole set of issues and at all levels of governance, not just the local level, also the regional, the state, provincial and national. Um, so, so what all of this demonstrates is that it's a tried and tested method of giving people a genuine voice um, of, of shaping policies. There's also been a few European examples recently. So um, in, in the Polish cities of Gdańsk and Lublin over the past two years, there have been four binding citizens assemblies designed in the same kind of manner that I just described. Um, here in the Netherlands, you might be more familiar with the G1000s, which are not quite the same, but follow a similar logic. And then of course, most recently we saw in Ireland, um, there was the referendum on abortion. And this was preceded by many, many months of deliberation by 99 citizens that were part of the Irish Citizens Assembly, which gave the recommendation to the government to hold the referendum in the first place. Um, so my first lesson here is that these have been tried and trusted examples of giving people a genuine voice in shaping the decisions that affect them, of bringing people together in a way that unites them and focuses on that rather than what divides them. And my second lesson though is that even though it's been a good first step, that it's not enough. So these have been mostly ad hoc initiatives and it really depends on the democratic champions who are the politicians deciding to do these kinds of things. So as soon as they are out of power or the political tide changes, these kinds of things stop. So what we would need is to institutionalize the use of these kind of mechanisms to on a more permanent basis give ordinary people a big role in shaping the policies that are affecting them to give them a voice to say there is an alternative so could we not have permanent citizens assemblies with randomly selected people who rotate and on different issues there's a different group of people um, working to to solve them because we have to remember too that not everybody wants to participate intensely all the time and nor should they. You know, we also all have our lives, our families, our jobs, our businesses, our associations, sports, etc. All of the other things that make life meaningful and purposeful and we, we don't want to have everybody permanently governing all the time either. So the idea is rather to give everybody the opportunity to at least once in your life have a chance to more directly influence a policy affecting you and your community and to know that on other issues it's other people like you who are playing that important role as well. And I'll just finish here with um, something that Peter McLeod, who is the main organizer of all of these initiatives that have taken place in Canada, um, he said to me when I interviewed him about his work, and what he said was that the problem is that we fear that we ask too much of people, but that's not the case. We ask too little of them because we all have a sense innately of when our time is being wasted. But if it's important and it's meaningful, 
time and time again, it's been shown that people are more than willing to participate. The opportunity just needs to be there. So to tackle the underlying drivers of populism, one, in the short term, we need more democratic innovations, but two, in the longer term, we need new 21st century democratic institutions that ask more of people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. Our next guest is Marton Gulias from Hungary. He has been declared a national security risk by the Or Orban government, which probably means he is doing, On his, the right way. doing his job well. Uh, he launched the Country for All movement, which holds debates and screenings in a tent across from the parliamentary building. Um, Marton. Thank you very much. Um, may I ask to put some light on the audience, because I like to see who am I talking to. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't consider populism as an inherently bad or dangerous phenomenon. Uh, in the upcoming five minutes, I try to argue for an understanding of populism where we could see the potential in populism and to repair the undeniable failures of our democracy. In my understanding, populism has three key factors. First, it shows the failures of democracy, failures where the governing elite, the rulers of the current hegemony, got alienated from its citizens. Second, it sharpens the conflicts, antagonizes it, uh, between the establishment and the citizens who were rejected from the decision-making progress and whose desire for a decent, sustainable life was not recognized by the rulers. Third, it simplifies the conflicts, uh, and that is why it could be dangerous and easily could turn into demagoguery. But it is not inherently demagogue. Now I'd like to provide you with three important characteristics to understand the key factors of the dismantling of liberal democracy in Hungary, the main problem with the politics of the Orban regime, and why I do think that only a left-wing populist movement could repair democracy in Hungary and in the European Union. The failure of the Eastern European democracy, Eastern European transition, the bankruptcy of liberal democracy in Hungary. Uh, the big promises of the transition were guarantees of basic civil and human rights and personal economic prosperity. These were the key pledges establishing the key institutions responsible for the rule of law and implementing capitalism will result in stability and prosperity. Quite the contrary happened. Right after the transition, more than a million people lost their jobs. The previously state-owned companies and firms got privatized and ended up in the hands of a few oligarchs. The Supreme Court denied the accountability of the political rulers of the dictatorship and did not defend the rights of the minorities. Public schools in Hungary were already segregated way before 2010 between white and, your, and Roma students. The labor code, did not longer protect the rights of the working masses who were exploited, had to work more than eight hours per day, and didn't even get the minimum wage, the Hungarian minimum wage. It is fair to say that Hungary was an eminent student in the 90s of, in the eyes of the Western allies, and our, and our elite established the skeleton of liberal democracy pretty well. They just to forget to involve the people. The lesson is tough and cruel. The imperfections of democracy could not be repaired by any court. My argument is that it could be repaired only through the involvement and empowerment of the people. Since these institutions were not accessible to citizens, it is no, won no wonder that the masses of Hungarians did not defend these achievements after 2010 when Mr. Orban got elected with his first two-third majority, the constitutional majority. So, Orban's illiberal state. Mr. Orban did not popularize democracy. He privatized it. He wasn't engaged in the, involve, in the involvement of the people. He induced depression, causing them to feel that their will won't matter. The real problem with Orban's illiberal democracy is not that it is illiberal, but rather that it is not a democracy at all. As I mentioned before, liberal democracy failed in many aspects to serve the people in Hungary. So when Orban occupied, destroyed, and undermined fundamental institutions, such as the Supreme Court and the electoral system, he destroyed something which did not have a value in the eyes of the majority of the citizens. 
simply because they didn't feel that these institutions had served them. So Mr. Orban harmed democracy and the opportunities for self-determination of the people. He restricted the possibility of any referendum. He turned the entire public media into a propaganda channel, depriving people from the access of information. And he destroyed the rudiments of the welfare state and social rights too, making it impossible for the, most of the people, especially the poor ones, to exercise their basic freedom rights. Uh, may I get the picture, please? Um, maybe you think that I sound some like, some, like someone who doesn't respect the rule of law or the achievements of the transition. If you think that, then I have to emphasize that less than 200 people demonstrated on the day when the parliament passed the new constitution back in 2011. I know it because I was the organizer of that demonstration. The picture above on the screen was taken on that event. Mr. Orban's biggest lie is this. He promised liberation from the bureaucratic and, field and failed institutions of democracy, but the only thing he delivered in return was nothing less than personal tyranny. The biggest favor you could do to Mr. Orban is to consider him as a populist. He is keen on his appearance as a leader of the masses, but in the meantime, he is not connected to the people at all. He is not representing the will of the people, he creates it. But that is not populism. This is demagoguery, and there is a huge difference between the two. And, last, uh, and the last uh, sentence. So left wing populism for the revitalization of the democracy in Hungary and in the EU. Um, Mr. Muller quoted in his book the famous lines from Samuel Beckett, which goes like this Ever tried? Ever failed? No matter. Try again. Fail again. Fail better. Mr. Muller argues for an understanding of democracy as a condition of constant crisis which dynamizes public life and deliberation. I do like that interpretation of democracy. Uh, but in order to be capable of trying again, being capable of failing again, and even failing better, requires strength and resources, which for the majority of my fellow Hungarians are not within reach. Most of them have only one chance in their life, and if they fail, they don't have the luxury to contemplate and, en and engaging in self-examination because they are existentially destroyed. This is why populism is somehow a necessity. In my country, most of the people had their shot. This is the widespread uh, belief reinforced by the mainstream media and the decision makers. And they failed. The promise of populism looks like this. If we are united with others who also failed, there is still a chance for us to gather for another try. In Hungary, in a relatively poor country, we still have the resources to make the necessary correction to turn our actual evil and cruel state into a non-cruel and a non-evil one. But that's just not enough. We have to create an equal and just society, but this will be only possible through transnational cooperation. Our goal is this reform of the institutions of the rule of law with the involvement of the people in order to create an equal and just society. And my conclusion is this. We are living in an era of populist democracies. The question looks like this. Whether there will be a leftist turn in these populist democracies or the responses to the ongoing tensions and crises in our societies will come only from the right wing. We don't have to give politics to the people. The task is rather to involve them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Our, um, our last speaker, uh, Flavia Kleiner, became a celebrity in Switzerland in 2016 um, when she fought the far-right SVP, the People's Party, with her group Operation Libero. And eventually, the People's Party was defeated at the polls. Um, how she did it, I'm sure we'll discuss that. Uh, please welcome Flavia Kleiner.
really hope we can get back, back to this last point of Marton, because I really wonder also what Jan Werner Müller is going to say Will about it. But uh, let me just quickly <coughs> raise a few points um, from my experience in Switzerland with Operation Libero. And first of all, for Operation Libero, this liberal democracy we live in is the best model that we can imagine. And therefore, we fight for it and we defend it, as you can hear from our name. And Brexit, the election of Trump and other incidents actually brought debates on writing populism into the Western public. But I need to say, you know, from Switzerland, um, experience, we know right-wing populism for 25 years. The so-called SVP, the Swiss People's Party, uh, in 92 already, they won uh, an initiative on Switzerland joining the European uh, economic area and Switzerland refused to do it. So for over 25 years they're raising in their influence and again and here I come to the founding moment for Operation Libero. In 2014, there was another vote on Switzerland's complicated relationship with the European Union. Um, it was about the so-called mass immigration initiative. And it was about actually restricting the free movement of people agreement that we have with the European Union. And it was accepted by 50.3%. And it was only about 20,000 votes that made the difference. You can imagine us really angry because that was a moment where all our fellow students just prefer to stay in bed than to go to the ballot box. So that was actually the moment uh, where Operation Libero was founded. We said this is no longer this country where we feel ourselves represented really. Uh, we want to raise our voices to promote Switzerland as a so-called land of opportunity instead of a free air museum that the right-wing populists want to bring us to, uh, like a country where nothing is supposed to change ever, but rather we should go back to the past, then to a future. And you must know that the SVP actually is the, the strongest party in Swiss parliament for a long, long time. And again, um, they were actually in the last elections um, becoming the biggest party. And also what we know is that unfortunately um, they are this role model for other European writing populists. So therefore, I would like to say if we manage to fight the writing populists in Switzerland, and they are the role model for other writing populists uh, abroad, then maybe also this positive case of successfully fighting the writing populists can be uh, an inspiration for people abroad. And therefore, I would like to um, tell you about this one initiative, this vote we had in 2016, February 2016. Um, and actually, this vote was only happening like four months after the elections. And as you imagine, I told you before, the SVP was the clear winner after these elections. And all the other parties were really, really down, you know. They had this hangover sort of, you know, I mean, what could we do? Uh, the writing populists went again and we just run out of, con of money and energy and whatever. And now the news, we're going to vote on the so-called enforcement initiative. What was this initiative about? It was about the like really um, consequent expulsion of criminal foreigners, but even for minor violations of law. So, for example, if you as a Dutch would be living in Switzerland and you would be driving two times too fast within 10 years, you would have had to be sent out of the country by a Swiss judge. And actually, what you should also know, 25% of the Swiss inhabitants, they don't have a Swiss passport due to certain really strict naturalization laws. So you see that it had a huge urgency, this case. And so for us, this is actually the moment where we said, again, we really need to campaign against this initiative. We need to manage to turn it around. And still four months before the vote, actually 66%, the polls said, would uh, vote in favor of the so-called enforcement initiative. So I chose to show you with this campaign my two lessons on how to fight writing populists. Mm, and the first is how to reframe the issue to gain back sovereignty of interpretation, I would call it, about the issue. 
and to be a patriot. And the second lesson is what I will call become a fighter, get out of the comfort zone and keep calm in the battlefield. So, the first case, this really conscious reframing. We were really, quickly we realized that actually it's on us to define the battlefield of this vote. So, if you would have led the SVP to be the first mover, they of course wanted us to find ourselves as the defenders of criminal foreigners, right? You understand? So we would be, we would find ourselves on their battlefield. We would need to defend the rights of criminal foreigners. That's a lost case. You have no chance, right? But then we said, so we don't start this uh, criminal, like this, this uphill battle, but we actually want to shape our own turf. And how did we do this? We knew that five years ago back then, we had another vote on a similar issue, and we knew that back then, actually, the Christian Democratic Party leaders, uh, the voters of the Christian Democratic Party and of the Liberal Party, they tended to vote with the right-wing populists. So we knew this time we need to gain, we need to get these people on our side. So what did we think? We thought we need to really reshape the turf and speak with arguments and speak of the values that we defend ourselves, of course, but that, are, that matter to these people. So we decided to speak of the Swiss values as you can find them in our constitution. So the fundament of our society. This is what we were staking. We're, we're speaking of this initiative aggressing our like separation of powers, of the rule of law, of this idea that the peaceful society shouldn't be a two-class society, where it actually matters what your passport is. No, everyone is equal in front of the law. And so we actually also managed to somehow challenge this SVP perception of we are the only patriots here in this country. Actually, we said, hey, we're also claiming to define what is Swiss in a way, and we also uh, bring back actually the whole idea of this is what is lying in our constitution, this is what is fundamental to us. And so therefore we used also uh, the metaphor of Helvetia, this is like the allegorical figure, the mother of all the Swiss, some sort, she's representing these values as you can find them in the constitution. And so our like visual for the campaign was Helvetia being attacked by a wrecking ball, uh, smashed away uh, from this so-called in enforcement initiative. And to us, this was really like showing actually uh, quite properly what it was, was about. And so the biggest compliment that actually the writing populist leader could do to me after the campaign, um, like we went it, was when he said, I don't know what happened, but at some point we only had to speak about rule of law. And there I said, yes, framing, check. So, and the other case, I will speak to you about the becoming a fighter. I think what I understand under this is like to keep calm, be professional, even if the pressure is high. I would also say you just need to get this like bulletproof West out of arguments and rhetorics to be ready uh, to argue against um, your political opponent. And also, I would count in this, like, never be arrogant, you know. Also, your political opponents, they have values, and they state these values, that's what they do. And that's actually, I would totally agree with Jan Werner Müller, that's what democracy is about. You're negotiating with arguments about what is, like, the values and the topics, the issues uh, that you want to, to see lift in the country. And Still, I would say kill them with kindness, you know. That's what we do. I mean, we, we don't see ourselves as a, you know, we need to state this and it's about the discussion and keep, keep a certain style but don't be too afraid of, yeah, saying straight things. And uh, so, but this I also, maybe another point about being a fighter, I also don't see it as being a, a martyr, you know. But it's rather about bringing really, like, to professionally just um, work out what you want to say and that you seriously work on this. And so it's mostly about getting out of the comfort zone. That's all I want to tell you. 
getting out of the comfort zone. I know it's, it can be uncomfortable, of course, but you, if you find allies, if you find friends to do it with, um, it's much better. And so to finish uh, here, why do I think that by what we do with Operation Liberal, we're acting actually for democracy? Um, I think we see ourselves as a translation service somehow uh, of liberal values to um, why they matter to people. And I think that's a really important issue to do in democracy, to speak about it and to do it in a popular way. I think you can be popular without being populistic in a way. You can find a language that more people understand and I think that's one of the most important things today. And so yeah, we call ourselves also the patriots of the constitution and uh, in the past um, two years we went like already four times against the writing populists in really like central issues. The first was the one I was mentioning to you about the expulsion of criminal foreigners. Another one was about asylum, a third one about naturalization of third generation inhabitants of Switzerland. Um, and the first one just now in March was about the fees to the public broadcaster, an issue which comes up in many European countries these days, and I would be happy to speak more about it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Flavia. Kill them with kindness. That's one line to remember. Um, we've heard Martin, we've heard Claudia talk about citizen assembly. Um, before we go to the audience, finally, I would like um, Mr. Müller and Pauschaffer to uh, respond uh, to something particular they heard and they want to respond to. Let's start with Paul Schaeffer. Um Well, one thing uh, springs to mind listening to all this, and that is um, uh, new forms of democracy, and especially the referendum. In the Netherlands, we have this long discussion about the referendum. I won't summarize it for you because it's very difficult to understand for people f coming from abroad to, inst to get a sense uh, why this is lingering on for 30 years in the Netherlands and we're not able to find new forms of democracy, even direct election of mayors and cities is impossible in the Netherlands to achieve. Uh, but I but when I st understand your um, speech about the, the, the Swiss um, experience, there I find examples that are, in my understanding, very stimulating and especially suited also for a country like the Netherlands mm -hmm. to find new forms uh, through the referendum and that you, that you prove, also like in Ireland, that the referendum is not per se, um, um, you know, the silent majority choosing for the illiberal option can be different, different outcomes are possible. So that is for me a great lesson and also a lesson for the Netherlands to learn. A second argument would be, um, listening also to the Hungarian story, that it, it's not only about forms, it's definitely also about substance. And coming back to the question of Brexit, for example, a more cautious migration policy of Britain that opened up its borders for East European migrants much in advance of other European countries would have very probably prevented Brexit because all the research shows that the question of migration was central to tipping the balance. And um, so in that sense, it's not only about r new forms of politics, but definitely also giving substantial answers in many areas where uh, there is discomfort or worries of citizens that are to be taken seriously, not by withdrawing into the back room and saying all these people who hate foreigners are right. No, but trying to regain a sense of the moral middle ground. And that is being torn apart by people who say on the one hand we need closed borders, on the other the reaction people saying we need to open borders, we need to reclaim the moral middle ground. And many of these stories uh, reinforce my belief that it's possible. Jan Werner Müller. I have to confess I feel slightly uneasy because I feel it's like an end in world production or American Idol where now the more or less wise judges, you know, sort of judge the uh, young people and their ideas. So I don't no, know. For, forget understood, no. forget the age difference. Way, yes. You, you yes, hardly exactly, notice it. Exactly. Hardly no cleavages. No cleavages. No cleavages. Um, but I saw you so writing for the entire time. So. Yes. Um, so three quick points. Um, I mean, these were all very, very interesting contributions. A um, couple of thoughts to put on the table, maybe also for further discussion. So on Claudia, I completely agree that these are important experiments. 
to pay attention to, and that in many cases they can very meaningfully complement representative democracy as it is. I don't quite see it as a reinvention of representative democracy. And furthermore, it's at least not obvious to me that it's a driver of populism as such that people say, I want to participate more. Very often they say, I don't feel represented. But that can at least sometimes be solved, quote unquote, or addressed by, for instance, the emergence of new parties be it, let's say, Podemos in Spain, which, you know, whatever else you think about their program, they mobilized lots of young people, highly educated young people, who clearly had said bye-bye to the system, but who now felt, yes, there is somebody there who basically communicates a certain anti-austerity message, for instance. So I think we should not give up on the whole idea of representative democracy too quickly. Or Marton, what you said was very moving. Um, what you described as populism, I would simply describe as democracy. I mean, involving people, making them feel represented. I mean, I thought that's what it's about. And I think everybody, every good politician wants to be as close as possible to citizens. There's no taboo on using emotions. That, for me, is not in and of itself particularly populist. It's a question of how you do it and to what, uh, to what ends. It gets a bit trickier. I mean, nobody really said this, but sometimes we hear this claim that, well, you know, the world is so complex and we need to explain to citizens things in these simpler terms. I mean, especially if people on the left say that, I'm kind of shaking my head. I mean, what are you really communicating? You're basically looking down on your electorate and you know what, even if you actually believe it, you sure as hell don't say it out loud. It's like the Clinton campaign in summer 2015 saying out loud, our, our goal for the autumn is to make her look more human. Well, even if that was your goal, <laughs> you don't announce it, okay? So I'm, I'm skeptical of that kind of meta talk. So I, I agree with a lot of the substance. I just wouldn't call that left-wing left -wing populism necessarily. Uh, just a brief point on, on Flavia. Um, and maybe sort of uh, in, in taking up your invitation to talk about a topic that we haven't really talked about that much. I think many people might agree that while we don't necessarily leave to, need to leave behind elections or the idea of representation, we do have a serious crisis of the kind of, if you like, combination of software and hardware which, which makes this whole system work. Namely, the kind of intermediary institutions such as political parties, and maybe even more important, the media as we used to know them. <laughs> Without that, representative democracy has an issue. It doesn't work as well as, as it should. Five stars, which you know we talk a lot about these days, is a kind of radical experiment built on the idea of being done entirely with the idea of a traditional political party, replace it entirely with a movement, whether they really are doing that or not, we can debate, and entirely dispensing with professional media, with Grillo basically saying, journalists are all corrupt, tell me directly via the blog what's really going on, I'll be the amplifier. And of course, that's not really how it works, but it's a very suggestive way to address this problem of intermediary powers. So I think that sort of needs to be in the conversation. How, in a sense, we might address that by saying no, Parties have life left in them. We just need new parties. Yes, old established parties are declining. People's parties are declining. But they had no monopoly on representation. So be it. If cho societies are changing, parties should be changing. And if we have new ones around in various parts of Europe, it's a good thing. It's not a crisis of representation. It's the opposite. It's solving a crisis of representation. With the media, I think it's much more difficult. I think we are still incredibly lucky in at least some European countries, you, you might not feel that way, but in some European countries to have a kind of working public infrastructure. In Hungary, as we all, I think, know, 90% of certain parts of the media are now in the hands of oligarchs uh, close to the government. That sort of raises a whole range of questions, what it means to do opposition, what it means to do the kinds of things you are trying to do, because up until recently, and also including in the US, I think we all still, deep down, we would just, we love a particular Danish fairy tale where it will just take one child to say the emperor is naked and the show is over. But Anderson's tale, remember, is premised on the idea that everybody can see the emperor and can hear the child. And in these highly fragmented or distorted media landscapes, we can't take it for granted that we all hear the child. So I think this raises an enormous structural problem that is not reducible to, to sort of the rise of populism issue. It has helped populism. But even if magically tomorrow all the populists that, let's say, we can agree on we don't like, even if they all disappeared, I think representative democracy still would have this kind of structural challenge. So on that slightly pessimistic note, I'll finish. Thank you. I'd like to give the audience a chance to pose uh, questions. I think you need, we have one. Yeah, uh, over there, the gentleman on the side. Hi, good evening. Uh, earlier we heard Mr. Sheffer talk about a quest for better elites. 
and I'm wondering if it isn't indeed a quest for different elites. Because I look at an example for like Barbados recently, small Caribbean island, Rihanna comes out in support of the opposition leader, and then that party wins all 30 seats in parliament. So I'm wondering, is there a role for elites in how we deal with politics going forward? And then I'm kind of also wondering is, can democracy survive without some form of populism? Because, and, and, and I'm hearing slightly a debate that popularity and populism is not the same thing, but at the same time, in order to be able to form a government, you need to win an election, so you need to be popular. So, so, so as sort of a newbie to the whole discussion on populism, can somebody maybe explain that to me? Mention your name, Paul. There's no escape. <laughs> Different elites, better elites, but I think it's a cycle of democratic renewal in itself when elites are being challenged and when new elites emerge. So I don't think that is a problem as such. On the contrary, the, the, the question is, of course, uh, which are, where are the new elites to be found that are emerging. Um, I would say the, 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 the liberal, right-wing liberal or left-wing liberal paradigm, which basically says globalization is a natural state of affairs, there is no alternative, this is how the way the world works, that is being challenged and uh, for good reasons because beside all the productivity it has uh, given to the world in cultural terms and social terms, there are definitely shadow sides to this globalization, new forms of inequality that have emerged, new forms of alienation. So I think a paradigm that was productive for 30 or 40 years is being challenged to the core, and that is why we need a new imagination. So I would look more in that sense for uh, new actors to emerge on the scene, new elites, but um, I'm not afraid in itself when elites are challenged or the establishment ch is challenged. On the contrary, I think it's a healthy sign of democratic renewal. And the second question, anybody can answer, I guess, but when it comes to uh, populism, I guess we answered part of that, whether that's necessarily bad. And yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, um, well, I'll answer that, and then I wanted to come back to, to Jan Werner Mueller's challenge as well. Um, I, I mean, uh, Jan Werner Mueller said it earlier that the problem with that is that populists are inherently anti-pluralist. So, I mean, it has nothing to do with being popular. For a long time, populists weren't popular at all. I mean, it's a phenomenon that dates, I mean, really till the early 1990s in many countries. Populists were just starting to emerge with, you know, five, ten percent, and we weren't talking about populism as being popular then. So I think that recently, because of improper media coverage, I would say there's been this misconstrued notion of what populism is, um, but it has nothing inherently to do with just being popular. Um, to come back on, on Jan, Jan Werner's points about you're not sure about um, people wanting to participate more. Um, I didn't go into the research due to the time constrictions, but th there is a lot of research actually showing that people do want to participate more and that there is greater distrust in elites now than there, there has been before. I mean, the notion of, of politicians being popular has, has never really existed, but we are at an, a new low, um, which we've seen. Um, and you know, one, one of the recent Chatham House studies that looked at 10 European countries found that only 8% of people feel like politicians listen to people like them. Um, my own re research in my previous book, The Popular Signal, which came out in 2015, um, ha had looked at this more specifically in the UK, um, and it did find that that uh, a disillusionment with politics was one of the key drivers of people voting for populists in the UK. Um, and research also by others like Will Jennings and um, Jerry Stoker, as well as even the Hansard Society, has shown that um, you know, people are much more dissatisfied with the way democracy functions today than they ever have at any other point. And the, main and the top thing that they would like to change more is giving citizens more of a say. Um, so afterwards, you can interpret how you do that. But I think there is some um, 
pretty strong evidence that one of the drivers, and actually I should also mention in that research that I did, um, I also at that time surveyed people about their willingness to participate in a citizens' assembly along the lines of what I, I described, you know, would you be willing if this was happening? And actually the highest levels of support were amongst people voting for UKIP and the SNP, um, which to me also indicates that amongst populists, there, if they are given a more constructive route to being able to express their views, they would be willing to take it, and we shouldn't dismiss that. Um, and I just want to link that also to the, the points that you made about it's not just about the forms but also about the outcomes. But I think we really need to remember that there's a huge link between who is deciding, how they're making the decisions, and what kind of outcomes we have. And at the moment, our system is really dominated by by older, white, well-educated urban males making most decisions. And unless we change who's making the decisions and how, it's much harder to get to the kind of equal and social just outcomes that, that we desire. So I think we shouldn't forget how interlinked those two things are. Okay, Flavia and then the audience, go ahead. I just wanted to quickly react on your question about popular and populistic. So what I meant by saying this, I think populists are really good at making uh, politics in a media society, and we live in this media society. So what my suggestion was is to say, let's try to, to find more popular ways in putting things so it will reach more people. It's a really simple, um, you know, um, conception, but uh, social media works this way. I mean, you get just like 20 seconds on social media, people just scroll down, right? And you're in concurrence with some cat videos, you know, and you want to, to propose something really serious. <laughs> um, so this is a challenge. Or what I want to say by this, don't choose the leading newspaper. I think here it's NRC Handelsblatt, right, uh, to push forward your ideas. That's really important, but it's Now you should be very <laughs> cautious. I'm writing for this newspaper. That's no. really good. <laughs> do it, do it. But I just want to you to be aware yeah. of the fact that maybe not everybody in, no, in Holland is, is, well aware of is, is, uh, is reading it, really. You uh, know? No, 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 absolutely. And what I want to say... I've never, I've never even heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> but what I want to say is here that, uh, and to make this example, in Switzerland we have the so-called 20 Minuten, so it's like 20 minutes, uh, and it's like uh, a newspaper, a quarter of the Swiss population is reading every morning. So that's where you need to get with your message. That's what I want to say. If you want to reach a huge public, go there. And what does it mean to your message? It means that you get one picture and five words. <laughs> that's it. And that's the deal. And you need to handle this. I mean, we could, you know. So that's all I wanted to say by we can be more popular. Thank you. Is there uh, somebody in the back row? Because the last time I only yeah. saw the people in the front row. Over there, in the, in the mid row, that's fine too. Thank you. Uh, question to Martin. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being here and for your presentation. And to all of you who uh, are young and uh, older. Um, Martin, You've been presented as, uh, yeah, in the presentation of you, uh, uh, our uh, mediator said, yeah, you were a security threat. So my question is, how do you negotiate this desire to open up, to broaden your constituency, to uh, win this war uh, with this, uh, yeah, with the, a climate in which you are an enemy, in which you are targeted, in which you are suppressed uh, in all kinds of ways in which you are state enemy and um, yeah how how would you be able to kind of uh, reach out uh, if you have this stigma on you uh, that's not quite a stigma so for example i don't struggle with problems like flavia just explained because uh, the best pr agency works for me in my country uh, the government uh, <laughs> because uh, you know as uh, mr Mueller explained uh, yeah Relatively 90% of the of the media is in their hands, and they are constantly labeling me as a kind of an enemy of the state. Uh, but you know, those people who are, um, let's say, in politely doesn't like uh, Mr. Orban's politics, uh, they know that okay, those people who are accused by these people are our heroes. So I. For example, just after the election, I didn't do anything at all. I was just, you know, sitting at home. I was lamenting about this entire uh, year we passed. 
and there were constant media attacks on me uh, in primetime TV shows, on newspapers, front sides, and uh, they accused me that I'm organizing a terrorist attack uh, against Budapest, and I'm inviting German um, anti-fascist activists who destroyed Hamburg, destroyed, um, and we are together are planning to uh, cause violent attacks uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the demonstrations which is coming up. Um, and this was constantly, you know, in the newspapers. So I had to deal only to, you know, respond to the, me the to the supportive messages which I got. But really, you know, hundreds of supportive messages from the people, and they are asking me that why I don't, you know, step ahead and form a political party or something like that. So I don't have this kind of a problem even in these circumstances, even in this very uh, restricted uh, freedom which I have in my country to get rich out of the people. Because, but, but another problem is coming back and it relates to, the, to your questions. That who are your constituents and uh, what kind of an elite you are in, when you are trying to represent those constituents. And uh, I would like to also um, uh, reflect on, 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 on your thoughts, because from my understanding, populism is not in the contrary of democracy. It's a kind of an installment or a kind of an extension for democracy in order to revitalize it. And that's why I described so longly, sorry, it was maybe too long, but that's why I tried to describe how the liberal democracy and the institutions of liberal democracy in my country were destroyed, but previ previously they were totally failed without any kind of a, you know, attack coming from Orban and his regime. So they were not capable on their own to serve the people on an acceptable level, and that's why they were easily become a target for Orban's rhetoric. Uh, but that's, that's you know, the, 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 the key uh, program for me, so I'm not against, I'm not against representative democracy. I'm just saying that we need those MPs on, you know, municipality level, national level, and so on, who are coming from those people who are need to be represented in such a places. And that's the problem, that our elite, opposition elite, is extremely alienated from these people which they are trying to represent. They are always talking about, we are understanding you. No. You don't have to understand it, you have to feel it, you have to experience it, and then you are eligible for representation. But if you are just saying, you know, in front of the TV camera that yes, I understand what kind of struggles a nurse has, which earns 350 euros per month for a job which takes 12 hours per day, six days a week, no, I couldn't understand that because I'm living in fucking rich reality. So I'm coming from the upper middle class. No, I couldn't uh, understand it. I could emphasize, I could uh, sympathize with it. But she, the nurse, has to represent the nursing community. And I could, you know, provide a platform. I could help her, of course. I could be an ally, but I could not represent a nurse because I'm just not living in such a harsh circumstances. Thank you. More questions from the audience. In the back, gentlemen over there. Sorry, I, I make you... Well, my voice is uh, I think loud enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, he needs some exercise, it's oh, fine. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. um, what, can I ask the panel, what can we do about Euroscepticism? And how can we increase the turnout of the voters for the European Parliament election next year in March. I think those are two very critical things. And I see three people from the youth sitting in the panel. So, uh, uh, and I also understand that uh, most of the youth did not vote in the last uh, European Parliament election. So I am very curious how we are going to solve this, uh, these two problems. In 20 seconds. <laughs> no, I'm joking, go ahead. No, no, I was not addressed, I think. Well, well, I will speak last, perhaps. You were best, so you were <laughs> okay, well, I would say, you know, for me, I tried to say something about what, in my view, Europe should answer to. Not being only a room for free movement of people, for enlarging freedoms, but also trying to address questions of protection, which the European Union is trying to do. That's one answer. The other answer is, in my view, that the, the traditional parties don't have any view of the, for the future of the European Union. So there's crisis management and there's populism. 
that there is no genuine vision for the European Union. You know, we used to have federalism. Guy Verhofstadt, Bel former Prime Minister of Belgium, is still advocating that, but he is very lonely. But there is no real alternative strategy, no vision where this European Union should go. So I'm not at all astonished that people are either turning to a real political project, which is populism, and don't feel very motivated by the sense of crisis management that is going on around the euro or around the refugee question, etc. So we need a genuine politicization of this European Union where you have conflicting views. I was the other day in a conference, last sentence, and uh, a former European commissioner, she said, well, while well, 30% makes the noise, populists, 70% continues to make the laws. And this was before Brexit, etc. And I asked her, how are you sure that this 30% will remain 30% and how are you sure that the 70% will remain 70%? Well, we're not so sure anymore. So new answers are needed, an idea where we're going. People want a sense of direction. And how do we get the youth back to the polls? Yeah. <laughs> 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 more <laughs> looks like that to me but i don't really have an answer to that one i don't know because i really uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic i'm pessimistic i have to say oh, but oh. but with a big smile <laughs> No, but, but I, I, I am genuinely quite pessimistic because of what you were saying, that it doesn't seem like there is any vision of what is going to happen still in the future. still a year to go, no? Yeah. Um, but it's to me, the, the, the big sign of a huge wasted opportunity was Macron calling for ages on a big citizens' convention on you know the future of Europe and so on. And what have we got in the end? A set of si um, watered-down citizens' consultations, which almost no one has heard about and are reduced to open town hall meetings, which you know I, I don't know about in other countries, but in Paris that means that the Minister for Europe speaking on a panel like this at three in the afternoon to whoever shows up. So to me that doesn't really show that the people in the EU see that there's a real problem, that something needs to change. They're not really interested in trying to tap into the collective wisdom of the people around the EU. You know, what should we do to solve the big issues on migration, on the euro and other things? Um, we need an optimistic so voice. Yeah, <laughs> if you have an optimistic yeah. response, uh, I, I don't have it. <laughs> no, I really, I would agree uh, with Paul what he said. We need a vision and I must admit, and of course I'm only Swiss, I'm not a member uh, of the <laughs> European Union, so anyway, won't, won't. Can I can. But what I want to say is, I think we need this vision and I must say that I think it won't be maybe the older generation which is in charge now, which will provide this vision. So I actually yeah. like what the, the elections are within, does. within a year. I will withdraw. Sorry. What, no, what, if, the, what if the sorry I'm to interrupt? Of, I'm speaking okay. of these, like, you know, these uh, presidents and, and prime ministers that we have these days right. uh, in charge. But they're terribly young, 31 years Macron, old. Macron, you know, Kurz. Austria. Macron is 40 years old. Two I mean, names they're, they're out of 28, well. you know, and I'm saying that this is actually what is bothering me. I think they're too, sometimes I think they might be too young to having lived through the war. And well, at the other hand, and on the other young. hand, let me say, and on the other hand, they are a bit too old to really risk new, you know, visions. And to me, this would be, I mean, it's always about trying something, no? In politics, you need to propose something, but at least Emmanuel Macron, I think he's proposing something, oh. right? I mean, let's look at Italy now. Che disastro, dai. I really think that, you know, there was no one like Emmanuel Macron showing up, and I really want to see this vision. That's what I think would mobilize more people. And also, maybe to find this sort of, yeah, a bit more um, emotional approach again to Europe, not this technocratic uh, approach. I really want to find this, like, yeah, maybe common emotion, I would call it, or like but, but the, the source, of, source of hope mm. uh, for the future of Europe. But the European elections are in 10 months, or I guess in 12 months, um, assuming that, that most prime ministers will still be in office and will have the same age, but then one year older. So that's not the solution. Uh, how do you make younger people go to the polls next year? I mean, let's, let's pretend this is an emergency. 
I think we need to make young people understand why it matters to them personally and why they have this right and I mean that they have the influence through this right and therefore oh. I'd really encourage every however old um, a prime minister uh, to talk to the young people as well. Well, but perhaps the example of Brexit shows, oh, no, you know, be 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 you. because it was lost. Uh, sorry. Sorry. No, because it was lost because part of the younger generation didn't participate in the vote. So perhaps that will be an example for many other uh, in the younger generation in other European countries that it could matter and that it is decisive. Jan Werner? Neither optimistic nor pessimistic, just pedantic. Um, <laughs> but just to say, there in a sense there are two very different structural problems at stake here. How to increase the turnout and how to defeat Euroscepticism. Very different issues. And with the latter, I think actually one of the challenges, even if you're super gung-ho enthusiastic about the EU, is actually to find structural way, structurally plausible ways of saying it's possible to articulate disagreement and dissent within the structure so that opposition that cannot articulate itself inside the union always automatically becomes opposition to the union. And I worry that if one basically sees the election as just a kind of affirmation of our love of Europe, and therefore we should go, it's almost at cross purposes. Because actually everybody indeed should feel there's something at stake, it matters. Of course, many national governments don't want that. They're already kind of going back on the whole with a lovely German word that apparently has no equivalent anywhere else in the world, Spitzenkandidaten. There's already a, an attempt to take that back in terms of participation. So that's a very different, different challenge, I think. And um, in that sense, if, if the turnout increases and people feel there's something at stake, I'm fine if Eurosceptics come out more. That's also different from Eurorejectionists, who really all out say the whole thing has to you know, be dismantled. These people, are, uh, of course, exist too. But I'd rather have, to quote the famous American President Lyndon Johnson, I'd rather the Eurosceptics, to the extent that they just disagree about policy as opposed to the nature of the polity, rather inside the tent pissing out as opposed to the other way around. Always good to quote Lyndon Johnson. A final question uh, over there. I actually see two hands, so we'll go to the gentleman first, and then the lady, and then um, the bar. Okay, then I'll, I'll make it very short. Uh, I was stuck with the word pluralism, um, which popped up. Um, isn't this whole, would you agree with me, that this whole discussion turns around the acceptance of pluralism, in your society, living in a pluralistic, liberal democracy. And I guess, as I've observed in Holland and Germany, there are quite a lot of people who think it's pluralistic enough or let it not be more pluralistic than it is now. And of course, they didn't feel represented because nobody was saying that until Fortuyn came by in our country and other people who stood up for that. I don't agree with that at all, but I have a feeling in discussions of Europe, um, the real issue is kind of taken away, and of course there are other ways of de making it more democratic, mm -hmm. but shouldn't we address the issue of pluralis pluralism? Martin. Living in a pluralistic society or not? Yeah, but you know, my example is completely different comparing to your examples because uh, I'm living in a society, in a, in a, in a monochrome society, a monopole society by, by one party. So uh, in my case, fighting for pluralism would mean that destroying this hegemony of this, uh, of this one party system. Because in the parliament, in the media, everywhere in the public life, uh, all the key institutions are occupied by the government party. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not the question whether we have to have more pluralism or not, because of course <laughs> we, would, we, we are in a need for more pluralism, but it would mean that somehow we have to destroy uh, this one party system which exists right now uh, in the middle of uh, Europe. Final question over here. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, my question is uh, relating to Flavia's sentence of beat them with your kindness. Uh, I come from Hungary, so I am completely familiar with uh, the current situation in my country. 
And it's completely true that 90% of the media is governed uh, by Orban, and there is only 10% who are actually free. And they are actually right now in a very bad situation asking for money from the people to make uh, continue their work. I would like to give two examples of what are the actual uh, risks of not having a free media. Uh, the first one is the five minutes which was uh, giving to the opposite parties uh, before the election. And one of them was even cited by John Oliver, the comedian, when one of the parties went to the media uh, press, to the national TV, to give a five-minute interview, dressed up as a chicken, just to give it, like in a humorous way, that this is actually uh, how people's opinion are counting right now in Hungary. The other story happened in the Netherlands, and this was in a radio uh, program. Um, I'm really bad with the names, which, but I know that this was like a very radical, a radical uh, radio program. Uh, and the person who was interviewed is uh, Judith Serengeti from Groenlinks. The and Green Left Party? Yeah. She is the one who is actually preparing the report for Article 7 procedure for Hungary. She's a member of the European Parliament. Exactly. So she was interviewed in this uh, radio program, and of course it was a provocative uh, radio program, and uh, the interviewer asked her about, af after a, a very reasonable question, uh, but very quickly he, he just uh, asked her, would you spit Orban in the eye. And <laughs> I think this is, this is like a completely human question. Um, just like when you really want to uh, show your distrust to someone. Uh, after actually what happened, uh, the editor said that, uh, yeah, uh, well, first of all, the interviewer said, uh, I think on Twitter, um, because, of course, it was picked up uh, by uh, the official media in Hungary, this uh, small piece of information. Uh, and the interviewer said, well, I can say whatever I want. I live in a free country. And the editor said, well, uh, we're going to uh, handle this situation internally uh, in our office with my employee who actually did this statement. So in a word like this, where this two things can happen, then actually you can go to the state media dressed up as a chicken because that's how your word count. Right. And the other one, then it's almost impossible to ask provocative questions. Mm -hmm. what, what's what, mm -hmm. My question is, in 2018, just 50 years after the big year of uh, 1968, what would you suggest how to reach people, how to reach young people in, in a situation like that when you are actually blocked, 90% of the people are basically blocked in your country? I guess, yeah, Let, let's, yeah. let's see who we, um, <laughs> who we ask this question to. Okay. <laughs> I think your, your fellow patriot is the right, right person to... Uh, I'm, I'm really I'm curious about it because we don't have the solution. We are struggling in this. But you are trying. Strange, same, uh, same situation since eight years. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I'm are, okay. are there dissidents of um, the 70s and the 80s? Are they source of inspiration? People like Conrad and others? Yeah. To what extent? I don't think that uh, more than a couple of thousand people are aware of the fact that we have a writer called uh, George Conrad. He's world famous here. Yeah. Much more, much more. Maybe a 10,000. Okay, so he's not the solution. No, no, but for you personally, this example of how they were struggling in a, in a very unfree environment to, to, sim to still get a sense of hope and to convey a, a program for democratic change. I mean, they were living under even more difficult circumstances than you are living. 
Are they a source of inspiration for you? I sense there is a populist turn in the panel called populist turn, where the Hungarians are grabbing the entire discussion. Uh, but okay, no, I, I, hijacking. Hijacking, yes. Um, but you know, um, no, I, I guess these examples are not working nowadays. Because uh, that was the problem with the transition, that those intellectuals who are really, you know, the, 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 the brightest minds of that generation, and I admire them, Conrad personally, even when he, even he you know, uh, said very harsh things about uh, the refugees during the crisis back in yeah. 2015. But still, he's really uh, uh, a bright-minded uh, writer. But the problem was with the transition that it was just, you know, a transition of the elite. So it was an elite change. So those people who governed the country prior, prior to the transition uh, changed their city with those people who were oppressed. But this was just, you know, a couple of uh, intellectuals who worked um, 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 underground uh, prior to the transition. And the problem was that the people who were really struggling and who were really, you know, enthusiastic about this whole change and who were, uh, you know, th th there were promises about you know, better, better um, life circumstances, uh, wage, uh, emerging, uh, em emerging wages, and so on. And nothing of that happened, as I've, you know, uh, told you in my, uh, in my speech, that uh, really a million of people lost their jobs in a 10 million country. So um, you couldn't say that it was a kind of a miracle. And those elites, which, you know, was a kind of a flagship of this change, uh, um, weren't, weren't sensitive enough with these kind of uh, struggles. And I guess right now, the most important lesson to those people like me and the others who are living in that bubble, that social class, uh, to not just to be sensitive with these kind of uh, struggles, but empowering those people who are struggling. Because still, I, okay, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, I'm quite an oppressed situation because I'm, you know, I don't have access to cultural institutions, I don't have access to state funds and so on, but still I have a privileged position in that society uh, in Hungary and I try to use my privileges to empower those people who are, you know, okay, I'm oppressed, but they are way more oppressed and, and, and way, so their life circumstances are very more harsh than mine. And I guess this is the kind of a solidarity which is not just, you know, meaning words and lines and sentences, but real and active so solidarity. So maybe the key um, word is active solidarity to come over on these uh, problems. Thank you very much. A last final word, because you wanted to say something. Um, no, please, go ahead. Sorry, Sorry I'll take your microphone. Um, no, just very quickly, because I think it also opens up a whole other debate, but I think that in response to that very real problem of 90% of the media being controlled in the longer term, um, I think that blockchain technology will be one of the main things that completely disrupts governments being able to do that. And at the moment, the technology is still very nascent, but there are people working on developing the kinds of platforms that cannot ever be taken down and cannot be censored and so on. And once that develops, I think that will completely transform society and politics and so on, but we're not quite there yet. Thank you very much. We have to leave it at this, but if you're quick, you can tackle one of these panel members before they leave uh, the room and you can just push them into a corner and pose more questions. But for the, um, for yes, you did sign up for that. But for the plenary session, uh, we're done. Thank you so much for coming. The Forum on European Culture will end tomorrow evening, which means there are plenty of more events. Just go to the website. And a special thanks, obviously, to the entire panel. Thank you very much. <laughs>